and welcome to the EBPL podcast, brought to you by the East Brunswick Public Library. We are known as our community's living room, so in this podcast, you will enjoy original, exclusive content, as well as encore presentations from events you have missed. This event was presented as part of our Just for the Health of It initiative. Just for the Health of It is a proprietary health literacy program developed by the East Brunswick Public Library to promote health literacy in Middlesex County. To learn more, visit justforthehealthofit.org. Now, enjoy the program. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Life After Stroke. So this is going to be a hybrid program. We have some people in person at the Senior Center, and then we also have attendees on Zoom. So today's program is brought to you by Hackensack Meridian Health and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Miriam Medina, MSN, RN, CNRN, SCRN, Stroke Center Coordinator at Raritan Bay Medical Center. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. And when available, the recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and there will be a part where you will be able to unmute yourselves and ask questions as well. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Miriam. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet everybody uh, in the uh, library as well on Zoom, so hi. Um, this talk is kind of, you know, it's all about life after stro stroke, excuse me, and there is life and hope after a stroke. Many people might think that after you experience a stroke that your life will change completely. It, it will change and a lot has to do with the severity of the stroke, the location of the stroke, and a lot of your support that you have amongst friends and families to assist you uh, post-stroke as well as the rehabilitation. So that's kind of what we're going to discuss here. I'm feel free. Uh, I mean, Kathy will control if you want to ask a question, but you don't want to type everything into the box. We'll just unmute it and you can feel free to ask your question. This is kind of just like a, you know, good conversation piece. Unfortunately, I'm not in the library. I love to kind of just talk amongst us like we're just having a good conversation. I've been um, doing stroke now for about 15 years at Raritan Bay Medical Center, part of the Hackensack Meridian Health System. I really, truly enjoy doing these community events. So let's start first with what is a stroke? And I think if you're on this Zoom call, you probably already know, but I'm just going to give you just some more details. A stroke is an event that affects the arteries of the brain. And a stroke occurs when that blood vessel that goes up to the brain that feeds the brain nutrients and vitamins is either blocked or there's a rupture in the vein, such as like when a balloon bursts. When that burst occurs, that means blood is no longer inside the artery going through. If you would, if you would think of it like a pipe, it's not going through there. It's now leaking out of that artery. So what essentially this, what's happening now to the brain is that is being deprived of oxygen and nutrients. And as a result, wherever that stroke is occurring, where the blockage is or the blood, that's where you begin to see some of what we call the deficits. What um, you got, uh, what everybody else might relate as to what is the symptom that I'm seeing that making me think, oh my God, this patient is having a stroke. You might be seeing the facial droop the weakness to the arms or the legs, the inability to speak. And all those deficits, as we say in the medical profession, it's all, um, it's effective. The, the experience that the patient is having as a stroke, it all depends on the location of where this blood vessel is affected, whether it be the right side of the brain or the left side of the brain, uh, the area within the side of the brain and the type of stroke, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic, as we can understand or, or think about it, it's related to blood. It's more serious than an ischemic stroke, but there are ischemic strokes depending on where it lands, where that uh, obstruction is located can be just as devastating as a hemorrhagic stroke. So these are regions of our human brain. And here you'll see its primary auditory is speaking, language, 
uh, ability to uh, perform thought processes, things that you learn where you focus them. Um, motor here, this is where you, in the, the central sulk guys is your brain is telling you, giving you the ability to move your arms up and down, hug yourself, walk, move your fingers. Uh, tasting is in this region here of your brain. Vision is in the back. Remember when mom says, be careful, I have eyes behind my, behind my head. That's where the visual cortex is. So whenever you fall, if you should hit the back of your head, when you become oriented to your surroundings, a lot of the times people get up and say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm seeing double vision or the room is spinning, things like that. That's because that part of the brain was temporarily affected. That's from trauma. When we talk about stroke is because the vessel is not receiving blood. This area down here, that's your cerebellum. That maintains your equilibrium, your ability to walk a straight line and not walk um, a taxic, meaning like when you ever see on TV where a police officer asks a, a someone to walk a white line to see if you're walking straight or if you're wobbling. When you have a stroke in this region here, the cerebellum, you start wavering back and forth on your walk. And then this here, this is your brain stem. This is the most critical piece of your brain. That's why it is nestled in this area here behind your cerebellum, as well as covered over the cerebrum, because all the nerves that control that the brain does to control your entire body stems from this area here. So a stroke that occurs anywhere near this, near, near, near this vicinity, excuse me, is devastating to the individual who is experiencing the stroke. So um, understanding stroke, we have to understand, as I just showed you in that previous slide, the right side of the brain and the left side of your brain. Our brains are divvied up, as I said, as a right side and a left side. On the right side of your brain, is it, it gives you the ability to organize your information. So when someone is giving you information like I'm doing right now, it's the right side of the brain that's functioning and absorbing this information and filing it somewhere in the brain. It also gives you the ability, your right side, to abstract meaning. When someone is telling you a story and you're understanding the meaning and the contents of it, it comes derived from the right side of the brain. Context, spatial relationship, visual information. You visually see something. It comes in through the right side of your brain and then you process. Uh, face recognition, again, that's that visual stuff. So sometimes some people are really good with names and faces or you're just good with faces and not good with names. That's your right side of your brain working that. Intuition, well, women, we have this real good intuition and sometimes the hairs in the back of our head goes up. That's the right side of the brain working. Our emotions, now some people can say um, those that are dominantly right side, right side dominant in their brain function are very emotional people. Um, also, they have very good imagination. Um, music and art, very uh, intuitive to music and hearing of, of um, like if you played a few notes to a song, they'll be able to recognize it very quickly. And all and what's critical to understand is that the right side of the brain actually controls the movement of the left arm and the left leg. Now, if we receive an injury, is that stroke occurs on the right side of your brain, this is what will happen or potentially can happen. Again, it all depends where on the right side it occurs. You can get what's called um, impairment in attention and left neglect. Impairment of intention is uh, the right side of the brain does not know in itself that it has a left arm and a left leg because more than likely it can't feel the arm or the leg and it can't see because the stroke is in the parietal region and in the back of the region. So in my mind, if I had a stroke on the right side of my brain, the whole left side doesn't exist because I can't feel it and I can't see it. I also have issues with memory. Like someone will tell me something like today is Tuesday, you'll come back later on, they'll ask you in the hospital, you, you have, have, the, the staff is constantly asking you a lot of questions and they have short-term memory. Um, decrease awareness of their deficits. They forget that they can't, 
that the left side doesn't exist because they can't see it. So if you ask them to assist you out of the bed, they get out of the bed like this and they forget that the left arm and the left leg has to come with them. Um, and um, they have altered creativity and music perception. Uh, and that's because if you recall, what the right side of the brain does is awareness of music and art. Now, our left side of our brain, um, and many of us are in the world left side dominant, and you'll know what your dominant side is usually by how you write. If you're right-handed, your left side of the brain is more dominant than your right side. Um, if you write with your left, you, your right side is usually more dominant than, than the left side. So that's a way of knowing which side of your brain is more dominant. Sometimes you can tell by some of these characteristics, um, if you're very musically inclined and crafty and, and so forth, you might be right-sided dominant. Now, if you're left-sided dominant, you have very good speaking, reading, writing, listening, grammar, um, skills, computation, analytical information, reasoning, logic, sequential thinking, um, time awareness, and control, as we said before, the right side of your body. Now, a left, a left stroke is a tad more devastating than a right-sided uh, stroke because it because of all these things that the left side of the brain generally does, which is speaking, reading, writing, and listening, and grammar, after a stroke, if it's on the left side of the brain, you have a lot of difficulty understanding spoken and written language, difficulty expressing yourself and what you want to say. Sometimes you have difficulty understanding what others are trying to say. There's changes in your speech. Um, verbal memory becomes an issue. Um, impairment in logic and sequences become difficult. Like you'll have trouble understanding that it's one, two, three, four. Sometimes you'll say one, two, and forget that the next number is three. Again, it all depends on <clears throat> the size of the stroke for these symptoms and also the location of the stroke. That being said, um, I don't know if anybody here in, in this group has experienced a stroke um, yourselves or your family member. And what's important with, what it, with, with this um, discussion is knowing where was your stroke, okay? I just explained to you what the right side of the brain does and what the left side of the brain does. And when there's a stroke on either side, what are the deficits you're going to have? Um, it's so important if you don't know that you ask your doctor, Doc, you said I had a stroke. Where exactly was my stroke? Because when you understand where your stroke is or was located, then you can understand, oh, this is why I'm having these issues, or this is why my mom is having these issues, or my father is having these issues because of where the stroke occurred. Now, this is, again, another picture of, of the brain. And this here is the temporal lobe. That's the area on the side of, of, the, of the head over here. That controls your hearing, you know, where your ear is. It controls speech because sometimes we need to hear and transition that so we can speak and short-term memory. If you have, then this is your frontal lobe in the front here. It's a personality, reasoning, a little bit of speech and some muscle movement. And this is the parietal. This is that top region here. It also is some speech and sensation, your ability to move, touch, and feel. And again, your occipital lobe that controls the vision in the back. So it's so important if you currently don't know exactly where your stroke is, that at your next appointment with either your neurologist or your attending, ask them, where was my stroke that you, know, that you experienced or your loved one experienced? So that way you can understand where are the deficits that came from it. Not only that, oops, I'm sorry. Not only that, not only do you wanna know where did the stroke occur, you wanna know what caused my stroke, okay? Why did I have a stroke? I don't know if anybody in this room might um, uh, know anybody who've had a stroke at a very young age, like 30s or 40s, because many years and for, for quite some time, everybody relates a stroke to, some, to the elder population, everybody above 60, 65, 70, those are the ones who have strokes. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true at all. Yes, a good percentage of strokes do occur to the older population, but we are seeing a lot 
of strokes occurring in the age of 50 to 65 years old. And that age bracket is having significant size strokes. They're just not small strokes. They're having significant size strokes where it's um, affected their daily activity of their activity of daily living, excuse me. And they're now having to seek assistance and being in rehabilitation for a lot longer because uh, they experienced a stroke. So it's very important to find out what caused your stroke because when you know what caused the stroke, you can work to prevent the next stroke from happening. So, and these are just, I'm just gonna go through the risk factors is obesity. Why is obesity a risk factor? Because the extra weight on your body um, produces, uh, is a strain on your heart, which can then bring you up to uh, create uh, hypertension and coronary artery disease. If your diet, um, I know diet is, oh, uh, diabetes, if you have diabetes, that affects the inside of your vessels, as well as if you smoke and high, high uh, blood cholesterol levels. And this is a lot of what you're eating in your diet. Alcohol consumptions, a lot of alcohol consumptions affects the liver. The liver inadvertently will then start to affect other organs, eventually getting to the heart, increasing your blood pressure, and then causing you that uh, stroke. Stress, I, I think, or I believe most people in this room, I, I doubt anybody has had a stress-free life, but I think you can relate how stress, when you feel that anxiety, your heart starts to pump, you feel palpitations happening. That is affecting your heart. If your blood pressure goes up at that one moment and is very significantly high, that's how you can get, that's how you can develop a uh, stroke. Physical inactivity. If you don't exercise, our heart is a muscle. If we don't exercise it, it will be, it will, it won't work to its maximum capacity. So this is why I particularly picked this picture because it's intertwining everything. If you don't exercise, you gain weight, and you're gaining weight because you're not eating right, so you're getting high cholesterol. The high cholesterol is not going to give you high blood pressure. The cholesterol and the blood pressure that might give you diabetes. Stress does everything. So stress, then you go into smoking. Uh, then here, this key thing here with medication is when you're seeing your physicians um, uh, for your regular kind of checkup and he tells you that you have high, high blood pressure or you have hypertension or diabetes, this key here is the medications. He's prescribing medications to control these risk factors to prevent this from happening. When we aren't compliant with our medications for whatever reason, um, we're putting ourselves at risk for developing a stroke. That's why if you look in the American Stroke Association's website, and it's a phenomenal website, they tell you stroke, 80% of strokes are preventable. And when you think about that, 80% is a large number to say that you can prevent something from occurring by 80%. And it's simply by understanding these risk factors and trying to do your best to minimize these risk factors, meaning exercising, um, reducing your stress, because when you exercise, you reduce stress, you reduce your blood pressure, taking those statin medications to reduce your cholesterol and your diet, uh, diabetes, controlling your uh, carbohydrate intake and exercising. And if you're on medications, taking your metformin, your glyburide, or your insulin, however level you are with diabetes. Okay, now, if we experience the stroke, some might have some physical effects of the stroke, okay? Um, you can manage physical effects of strokes and even thrive. It all depends on the severity, as I keep saying. Some people might just, their arm is just a little bit weak, then you see other people who have where they can't move that arm at all. It doesn't mean life ends because you can't move an arm. We have to start now training the brain to compensate for that one deficit here, or maybe to the arm and the leg and, and do other things and retrain our brain to do things using the left arm and the left leg. So some common physical changes after a stroke that I think many of us might have uh, seen others experience through conversation with our friends and family is weakness or paralysis of one side of the body. Um, fatigue. After a stroke, many, many, many people 
um, have fatigue, uh, you'll find that the patient sleeps more than 60% uh, of the day. And their fatigue, because the brain has just gone, oh, just gone through this, um, this, this stress, if I may put it that way, that it needs to recoup itself. And the only way it recoups itself, it tells the body, let's shut down, let's sleep, let's relax so I can recoup. Spas spasticity, excuse me, try saying that three times. And that is when you are moving the arm, when there's stiffness to the arm, and then it does this kind of shaking to the arm. It looks like it looks like, you know, someone might say it's a seizure, but it's not a seizure. It's if the person always keeps the arm in the same position and doesn't exercise it, when you try and stretch the arm, even the leg, the patient starts to shake a lot. And that is very painful when they experience that. Again, to minimize spasticity, you need physical therapy. Then there are, in some cases, patient might experience seizures after strokes. And with that, then they're going to have to take seizure medications and be very careful and mindful of their surroundings and, on, and try and understand what might trigger the patient to have a seizure. You might have difficulty swallowing. That's, fate, that's termed dysphagia. And um, you might have to change the consistency of your diet to a puree or a soft consistency so that way the person doesn't choke. Because the number one um, complications post-stroke is... Um, aspiration pneumonia, and that usually what brings patients back to the hospitals after they're discharged and they're in rehabilitation. If they uh, try and eat too fast and have dysphagia, they end up with pneumonia. Trouble with balance, as I mentioned, the area of the cerebellum that controls your balance. So if the stroke is in there, you're going to have this air, this difficulty with um, balance. Pain, um, the pain, uh, I, I'll go into that in a few other slides, is common, but not too, too common uh, for stroke patients. And one side neglect, depending if you've had, it's usually when you've had a stroke on the right side, you neglect your whole left side of your body. That is where you usually see this neglect. Now, another area um, besides the, the, um, the uh, motor, areas that we just discussed. Now it's communication. Um, after experiencing a stroke, there's sometimes their cognition difficulty, their speech and language understanding. And um, this is most difficult because someone is trying to say something and, and, it, and it's not coming out the way they want it. And a loved one might be assisting them by finishing the sentence. Oh, they're saying, oh, Harry just wants, Harry wants to know how you're doing today. And um, Harry might not want to have said that, but his wife finished a sentence for him. That then gets Harry angry because you're not allowing him to prosper on his own and try and finish the sentences on his own or give him the opportunity to communicate or find a new way to communicate. And um, this is where when you're in uh, rehabilitation for, at, with, you know, with stroke, Patience is of the utmost um, because you will test your patient's level, your level of patience, patience when you start to take care of someone post-stroke, uh, whether it's in a hospital as our stroke nurses, whether it's the caregiver taking care of the patient in the rehab center, because these stroke patients, depending on the severity of the stroke, require a lot of patience. And with communication, because as I, we mentioned when we went through the parts of the brain, the left area of your brain here, your temporal and frontal area, that's the part that controls your speech, your ability, ability to communicate, as well as with some cognitive um, ability as well. Um, the, where I just mentioned the location, there's three... Um, common communication problems. And you might have heard the first two, not too much of the last one, aphasia. Aphasia is a common communication problem after a stroke, very common. There's three types of aphasia. There's expressive aphasia, where someone asks me, um, what is your name? And I'm like, uh, and nothing comes out. I can't express myself. Receptive aphasia is, let's say Kathy was telling, uh, 
was explaining everything, the rules and the regulations of this forum. And uh, I start to speak and it has nothing to do with what the forum or the discussion that we're about to have. You speak to them and they don't understand. They cannot conceptualize the conversation. So when they speak, you're looking at them like, where is that coming from? That's expressive of, of expressive of, um, I'm, I'm sorry, receptive aphasia. I'm sorry, I apologize. Receptive. They can't understand what's being said to them. And when they speak, the two just don't match. And then there's global aphasia. And global aphasia is when the person truly cannot express themselves or cannot understand themselves. And it's usually their language is to two words, yes and no. So we have to work around that and only ask them questions where it's going to be where you're looking for a yes or a no response, such as, are you hungry? And you might have to show a picture to that person of food. And are you hungry? Yes or no. Um, and then uh, having to go to the bathroom, you might have to show them a, a picture of the bathroom with the toilet and say, do you have to go to the bathroom? Yes or no. So global aphasia is the most severe of those three um, forms of aphasia. Expressive, I can't speak. Receptive, I can't understand. Then there's dysarthria. And that affects the muscles around your mouth and your tongue. So basically, when the person is speaking, when they have dysarthria, they uh, sound like sometimes they're slurring, stuttering, or mumbling in their speech pattern. And if they have a significant facial droop, they start to speak something like that. So it just sounds funny, their dysarthria. Uh, it could be mild, moderate, and very severe. Um, then there's apraxia. And the only way to kind of explain apraxia is to watch a little video. Um, it affects the ability to speak, but you, it's just very slow. You, you know what you want to say, but it comes out very slow. So if I may, I'm just going to connect to this YouTube. It always comes up with the, oh, here it is. Perfect. Hi. My name is Gina. I am four three year old. I have Rexia speech. I Six, six months ago. See, I, so that's what apraxia is, where you know what you want to say, but it's just not coming out at the speed that your head might be wanting to say it. And this is a lot of speech therapy. And it's basically, you have to slow down. You have to think of what you say and slowly, as you just saw in the video, apraxia. This with time does get better, but it requires a lot of practice to speed up your voice um, compared to what you're thinking. Now, I wanna stress aphasia, dysarthria, and apraxia do not cause a loss of intellectual ability you still have that intelligence that you had. It's just you have difficulty expressing it. So even though it, it's difficult for a survivor to speak, it's not because of lack of intelligence. And unfortunately, our society kind of links the two together that someone in that video that, you, that we just saw would think, oh, she's not intellectual. She's, you know, uh, not there, you know, and kind of, uh, bypass their person's intellectual levels. It's not, it's just you have, uh, you, you're having an, a, a difficulty expressing what you want to say, but your brain's intellectual is intact. Um, now, stroke survivors also have trouble with memory. This is different than your communications because me memory is around the cortex region in the parietal area of, of the brain. So that is more serious. That can affect your cognition. 
okay? And if a stroke is in that area, it affects planning, organizing ideas, making decisions. So that's why it's important to find out where exactly is the stroke, because if it's affecting the patient's memory and intellectual, those people cannot sign legal documents, okay? Because it can be challenged in a courtroom if you've had a stroke in an area that's, that's compromised your intellectual thinking. Uh, a stroke a stroke survivor, excuse me, may remember for only a short amount of time, have problems transferring learning from one setting to another, like we can't keep them very busy. Um, it's, it's just like a toddler, you have to give them one activity at a time, do the activity, finish, get your bearings together before you move on to the next activity. activity. Having trouble absorbing new information, sometimes you have to repeat the information several times before they grasp it. Um, mix up deep details of an event. They can be watching TV. And if you watch TV, a story on one channel, and then you switch it to another channel, and they're kind of covering the same um, story, but in a, in a different angle, that, that the, the individual, the stroke patient might mix the details up of the event and say, oh yeah, that, that was a shooting from yesterday. No, that was a shooting from today. So that's what, that's what I mean when they mix up details. Again, this is all in the cortex area of the brain. Now, managing pain um, after a stroke, um, it, it all again depends on the area of, of, of the brain that you've had this infarct and um, it can affect the quality of the patient and the caregiver alike. There are four common areas that cause pain for a stroke patient. One is the shoulder area. That's one of the most common pain issues. And that, that, it, that comes about because the stroke affected their ability to move their arm. So if they can't move it, they tend to keep it in that one position and they may keep it in the sling and then they don't exercise it. When you don't exercise it and give it that range of motion that it needs, even though you can't move it, but somebody else moves it for you, you can get a significant amount of shoulder pain. It's similar to what you might feel if you have arthritis when you're getting up in the morning, that kind of pain. But what do they tell you with arthritis? Uh, you have to move it as much, as much pain as it is in the morning. You got to get up and start moving those muscles because when you move it, it's not as painful, but as an arthritic patient, if you if you say, okay, I won't move it because it doesn't, it won't hurt. Then, then you're you're causing the stiffness in the muscle, and with time, that's going to cause a lot of pain of um, pain in the area around the socket here. So that's why you might see in physical therapy a lot of the exercises are the range of motions that go up like this, up like this, and over like this. So the best way to minimize shoulder pain is by doing significant amount of range of motion. Um, spasticity, as I spoke before, is an abnormal tone that causes muscles to consistently contract. And it comes like, uh, like dominoes. If you have the shoulders and you don't move it and you keep it this way, eventually you will get the spasticity because if you've left that position for maybe even a month or two, and then you go to rehab, when they try to extend that arm, the arm is gonna start doing this and you're gonna fight it. And that's where you're gonna get a spastic, what we call a spastic arm. Um, again, to prevent that is constant range of motion um, to the extremity, as well as if the issue is in the legs, it's constant range of motions with the legs. And these are exercises that you can do while you're sitting down in your chair is just lifting the leg up and down. And then you lift the leg up. I know you can't see okay, I'm sitting, but you lift your leg up and then kick out and bend and come down in some range of motions to your lower extremities is bringing the leg over, out, bringing it in, out, bringing it in. Even when you're sitting down, just watching television, do that constant motion and stretching. Um, immobility of the muscles and weakness can also cause pain. I imagine, I, I relate this a lot to arthritis um, when you're not using it, the pain. Headaches are, and then the last one is headaches are not that common following a stroke. But when you do have headaches, you need to be uh, mindful um, because it can be also the sign of a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, but there is a, a, a significant difference when, you, when someone who's experiencing a hemorrhagic stroke and they complain about headaches. Because when they, they put their heads here and they go, oh my God, 
This is the worst headache I've ever had. I can't stand this. Oh my God, my head, my head. That's usually someone who there's a good high probability is having a hemorrhagic stroke. So if you've already had an ischemic stroke, you are prone, you have the high probability of experiencing another stroke. So headaches, um, depending if they're dull headaches, they're probably not too serious to mean that they're going to be hemorrhagic. But when someone is saying that they've had the worst headache they've ever had and they've already had one stroke, please bring that patient or that person to the hospital and have them evaluated immediately. All it takes is a simple CAT scan of the head to be done. And when you come to the hospital and you explain these things, they usually activate what's called a code stroke or a medical alert. A stroke and they bring the patients, they'll take some blood and then they bring the patient stroke straight over to diagnostic imaging and they do a CAT scan of the head. It's basically a little picture of the inside of the head to see if there's any bleed occurring. And that is the number one thing you want to rule out when someone comes into the emergency room complaining, complaining of this really bad significant size of, of a headache. Because if there's bleeding, then we have to transfer those patients to a comprehensive hospital where they can do surgery if it's warranted. Um, stroke and depression. I don't think um, that you would think it's too far fetched that once you've experienced a stroke, that there is a high probability of experiencing depression with it. It's the most common psychiatric complication of a stroke. And when we say complication, it's because you can have um, a small amount, I don't want to say small amount, but you can have, you can experience some depression, a significant type, much more and more depression, and then severe depression that sometimes you might even want to take your life. That's how bad the depression is because they cannot cope with what the stroke has left them with. Almost a third of those who've had a stroke develop um, depression. However, most, and it's, the number could be very high, but many of these cases are not always diagnosed. And here, um, I'd like for you to just really focus on these symptoms of post-stroke depression versus post-stroke apathy. In a stroke with depression, you, there's a loss of interest in activity, and it's not improved with others encouraging to participate. So if you have a barbecue in the backyard or there's a gathering happening at the senior center or a gathering happening in the park and you're trying to encourage the person to come, they're like, no, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go. Um, they, 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 they describe it as I'm just sad, I'm down. I just wanna be left alone. You sometimes find them crying um in the privacy of their own little space you might see them crying and um is their distress by their symptoms it's kind of evident whereas in apathy it's decreased initiative in undertaking activities they're they're like if but but they enjoy the activities when someone else initiates it so if the wife says come on let's go to the uh the senior center they're having bingo oh Oh, okay. I guess so. So they're willing to participate in the activity because somebody else brought it up, but they participate. That's that apathy. Um, they say, you know, if the, if the spouse is like, come on, honey, you, you, you're being just sitting there like a bump on a log. Come on, let's go. Let's get up. Let's get up. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. Everything's all right. I just want to sit down. I want to watch the game. I want to like, leave me alone. Leave me alone. That's the apathy. Whereas the depressed person is quiet very into their feelings and and you can imagine uh why it has occurred because if you've had a stroke that affected your right arm and your right leg and that's your dominant side where you write with your right hand uh, and you eat with your right hand now someone's trying to figure out well how, how how do i do things when i can't use the arm that i've always used and a good caregiver a a, a positive response but the, would be to that is, yes, but you have the left arm, okay? It's not the end, it's not the end. You have the left side that can now compensate for the right side that's not working at the moment until you continue rehabilitation. And then perhaps we can get some of that right arm back, okay? So if someone that you know and love or of interest, you see that they're experiencing depression, 
helplessness, hopelessness, please, please have them see a therapist or someone a, a, a go to a support group to try and get some help because when depression is not addressed, many times it can lead to someone taking their own life. And this is why rehabilitation is so important when it's post-stroke. We can't blow off rehab or patients say, I don't need it. I don't need it. No, no, no. Let's just go. Let, let's go home. I'll, I'll, I'll do everything on my own. I'll do everything on my own. Because the, the team of the rehab, they are doctors and nurses and techs who, are, who their goal is to prevent any medical complications that you as a lay person may not understand from the stroke. They pre they'll prevent deconditioning and contractures, what I was just talking about constantly keeping the arm here. And they help you to train your brain to learn new skills. Rehab um, can take days, weeks, months, even years of rehabilitation. Um, it's a long process and rehab, the bigger the stroke, the more rehabilitation the person is going to need. And this is where I wanted to um, offer you when it comes to rehab and the size of the stroke. It's very important for if, if the loved one is, happens to be in the hospital is where should they go to get this rehab? When you've had a significant size stroke, these inpatient rehab facilities are the best for that patient because they're going to get 24 hours a day rehabilitation care under the direct supervision of a physician and receive constant therapy, occupational speech, at least three to four times a week. Then there's a skilled nursing. This, the patients who need uh, daily skilled nursing or rehab care will not tolerate the intensity of an inpatient. So if a person has had a very significant stroke that they can't uh, move at all, they're constantly sleeping, they, those probably end up going in the skilled nursing facility. They do receive rehab, until they get strong enough that perhaps we can move them to an inpatient facility. But to be in an inpatient facility rehab, you have to be awake and alert to your surroundings because they are really going to give you a lot of exercises and therapy to start stimulating the brain. Then there's the long-term acute care facilities. This is for a patient who's had, again, a significant size stroke that might have left them um, in a vegetative state in an area where they're, they do minimal um, communication or interaction with their loved ones um, or even with their daily activities of care that they don't participate too much. Then there's the nursing home. Um, here patients who don't require skilled nursing, um, they live independently, they can go here to a nursing home. Then we have outpatient clinics. These are patients who's had a very small stroke and you can go in uh, three times a day from home and what they call outpatient uh, rehab. And what you do is those um, exercises that they explain to you in the outpatient area, you bring them back home and you, and you follow those same um, exercises at home as well, because the more you do it, the stronger you become. Then there's home health agencies where it, uh, the physical therapist comes to your home and does the same thing. It's kind of the reverse of an outpatient. The physical therapy is coming to your home rather than you going to the outpatient facility. So those are things. Now, what are some things that help the stroke recovery uh, period? There's recreational therapy. I've done this and I've had classes on this. And this is quite amazing. If I didn't see it for myself, I, I would not truly understand it. It is painting. Um, this is a holistic approach that combines physical, social, cognitive, and emotional functioning of people with disabilities. When you all get into a room, you start chit-chatting, and you have someone guiding you into um, drawing a painting that you otherwise might have not thought you'd be able to do. And it, it's very encouraging and positive for that stroke survivor um, to see that they have the ability of still expressing themselves on a canvas. 
Um, I know, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, several places in the Edison area that have these, and they also have them as social events where um, they have dinner and wine, and, and then you you have these uh, um, canvas drawings and stuff like that. That's a little bit more for, you know, like going out on a Friday or a Saturday. But this recreational therapy is guided by someone who has a degree in um, occupational therapy or recreational therapy when they're working with either stroke patients, patients who are experiencing depression, autistic patients, this type of therapy is, uh, is guided by some a professional. It's just uh, a professional who understands disease processes. It's not, uh, we, they call it recreational therapy, but it's more for the engagement of developing the skills that they have or, or still do have from as a result of the stroke. Um, it, it's wonderful. I, I highly recommend it. Um, and it's something that um, if you find it, if truly just uh, put it on Facebook. I, I don't have that ability to put it on Facebook or Instagram or things like that because it is a, a great experience to, uh, for the stroke survivor. They have this extreme happiness after they finish one of these sessions. And sometimes you don't finish it all in one session, you end up coming back several visits, you know, once a week and you accomplish this huge, they're looking at this huge canvas and they're like, I'll never be able to finish it. But you finish it in portions, in pieces. And when they put it all together, it's very rewarding. And um, the other two things um, is that we, uh, we should not underestimate the internet or resources on the internet. If you go onto YouTube and you go stroke rehab for videos, there are these two therapists, and I'm gonna show you the video here. It's called Bob Shrupp and Brad Hynek. Um, they're two therapists with a lot of experience. They, they are true, true therapists. Oh, in less than 10 and they give you, let me see if I can skip here, it skip the ad. Bob I'm just going to jump over here and they actually walk you through exercises depending on what um, deficit you have. And this is something you do lying in bed. Maybe you need somebody to help, right? It's going to be the assistant, but the first one you do is I'm putting the strong leg up. And then I, if I can get it up, I'll put the weak leg up. But if I can't, you're going to have to help me. Right, so we're okay. And then we're going to start with some rotations back and forth like this. And again, if it's going to flop like this, Brad may have to help right. and help me roll back and forth. Usually you can just sit on the bed right yeah. here and, and only help as much as you need to. Right. You know? I'm going to let go, hold, there, you get it back up. Uh, yeah. And sometimes if it gets a little easier, Brad can provide resistance. Sure. You can push, 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 push yeah. There we go. And verbal cues, asking yep. the person kind of help out. And sometimes pushing down through the leg. Right. And they have several, the I mean, like a hundred uh -huh. videos yeah. um, that you can scroll right. if you that join their um, one, YouTube channel. Seven. And it'll give you a whole bunch of ideas on uh, exercises that you can do pertaining to where the deficit is and to, to help correct the deficit. They're two great guys. They try and be funny, but they're not all that funny. But the information that they give you is excellent information. And I, I refer this as if you have um, capped out your rehabilitation um, dollars with Medicare, um, or you don't have insurance, these are guys that you can go onto the internet and follow these exercises on your own, well, obviously with family member or friends to assist you. See here, they're showing you how to do a pelvic tux and they explain everything. And this is the same thing that would be that would be going on if you're actually inside physical therapy, going to a place or actually staying in a rehab center. So this I wanted to share. Um, since we're uh, taping this, you can refer back to the uh, the uh, video and, and see what it's all about. And then there's music therapy for stroke rehab. This is another uh, rehab channel or or, or internet uh, company that has awesome information. They're called Flint Rehab, and they provide a lot of tools. 
They also, when I go into it, you can have a full body exercise for free, but that's the link. Six ways that music therapy for stroke uh, patients boosts, boosts recovery. And you can get this free rehab exercise um, book if you'd like. These are seeing the exercises through a book. Uh, so if you're a visual uh, reading type of individual, you can get this. If you're a, a visual, you can look at the other video. But here they explain what is music uh, therapy. This helps with speech when you sing. It's actually easier to sing when you're speaking rather than trying to speak. That's how they work with individuals who have stuttering problems. They actually encourage them to sing what they want to say until you start to control the uh, vocal cords. So you have that here. And they tell you what the benefits of music therapy is. It promotes neuroplasticity, which is the ability to rewire. And that's what you want to do, rewire your brain. Okay, just like when we did electricity in our house, we want to move the socket from down here and we want to bring it up here. We're rewiring it. So we're re rewiring our brain. Our brain is a phenomenal organ. We just have to understand it and work with it. Um, improves movement when, when you're listening to music. It does recover speech by singing. So this is a great page. I, also, I often refer it to... Um, Many people who ask me like, you know, where can I get some information? These are the two places that I personally, it's not something from Hackensack Meridian, but I personally um, ref reference it too, because I work in, in my area of Perth Amboy, many of our, our uh, patient population here are not insured. So they need other resources. And these are two resources that I, um, I always recommend um, to people. I know it's being videotaped, so you'll be have access to it. And I hope it's helpful um, to all that are either on Zoom or in person. Um, so, you know, recovering from a stroke is possible. It's a matter of, like I've been saying, retraining the brain. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right. So thank you everyone for joining us, for the people who joined us in person today, and also for the people who joined us on Zoom. <laughs> and um, so I guess that's it. <laughs> thank you again. All right. Great. Thank and, you, Kathy. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. It just This is a great presentation. Very right. helpful for everyone. All right. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Okay. Well, thank you. Take care. Thank you for joining us for today's episode. You can enjoy our previous episodes by subscribing now using your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at www.ebpl.org.